last week we talked about the echoes from the empty tomb. And today we're going to talk about the living power from the empty cross. And I think that this is a great time, springtime, to be able to rejuvenate our lives. I enjoy so much the springtime. Flowers begin to bloom, jonquils, daffodils, trees are leaping out, warming up. I like warm temperature. And uh, cherry trees blossoming. Golf courses are greening up. I smell golf in the air. For some reason, Pastor Bruce, I just smell it. Springtime is a great time to rejuvenate our emotional life. And I know it happens to me every, every year. Wintertime, no leaves on the trees, dark, dreary, and I get a little bit that way. And then spring comes along, and everything is just so much different. And I think this is a great time, starting today all the way through next Sunday, to rejuvenate our spiritual life. Oftentimes our spiritual life becomes dreary and dark during the winter time. We have a lot of sickness, a lot of flu. Uh, people are uh, out of work. And uh, we kind of lose sight of our spiritual life. And I think it's a great time, the Easter season, to rejuvenate our spiritual life. And I would like to help us to begin that today, the Easter season. Take this moment to make a change, to make a difference in our spiritual life life. We are intrigued with the crucifixion, no doubt about it. Something happened almost 2,000 years ago. And I, for the life of me, try to bring 2,000 years in close to me. And it's one of the most difficult things that I can ever do. What really happened upon that cross almost 2,000 years ago? It's hard for me to relate to that because I live in 2017. And yet I know it's so important what took place upon the cross of Calvary. Palm Sunday is when Jesus was making his entry into Jerusalem. The palm leaves were laid out and branches. And he's going to die upon the cross. Very, very special time in our lives. And we think about the crucifixion story. Everything about it. The agony in the garden. The betrayals and the denials of the Lord Jesus Christ but those who he loved the most. And then there was the arrest of the Lord Jesus Christ. Going before the Sanhedrin. And there in that trial. And eventually before Pilate. And the sentence was given. Release Barabbas. Crucify him and crucify him. And we get intrigued with that story. It's a great story. We have a cross up here before us today. And so much took place upon that cross. Almost 2,000 years ago. But we look at an empty cross, and we look at a wooden cross, and to think of what happened on that day is hard for me to relate back to 2,000 years ago, the suffering and the agony that Jesus Christ was going through. Not only do we love the story and to read about it and to study the story of the crucifixion, but in a doctrinal way, we like to know exactly what happened. How does it affect me? And of course, we know the two things that we always talk about, the forgiveness of sin because of the crucifixion. But aren't you glad that you have the forgiveness of sin for your life today? Wonderful, wonderful thing to know that if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, because of what took place upon the cross, He will forgive us of our sins. We not only think of that, but we also think of the promise of eternity. We think of the promise of heaven someday. And we all want to go to heaven. Amen? I think so. Probably do. If you don't, you might think about that. We think about heaven because of the cross, the forgiveness of sin, eternity, heaven has been offered to you and to me. But that still does not satisfy me to think something 2,000 years ago had that much of an effect upon my life on this day. And I thought, how do we bring it in close to us? In 2017, on April the 9th, at 45th Street and Seneca, at Glenville Church, sitting in a chair that you're sitting in, 
How do I bring that experience that took place upon the cross into my focus today as to how I can relate to what Jesus did on that day? I want that. I don't want to just read about a story. I want to know how that story is going to affect me. I think the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20, if you have your Bibles, turn there. You have it on your phone, your app. Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20 is a great verse. And I think in that, in that verse, the Apostle Paul can bring that experience to me today in 2017. And I just love this scripture. When I first in the ministry, I, you know, I had a lot of pride. And I thought, you know, I knew everything about scripture. And I thought... I could preach on Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20, and man, I could preach a pretty good sermon back in 1970 in that era. And then I got to thinking, I really didn't know a squiddly dot uh, squat about uh, that, that verse. So I, I just got up and gave a bunch of information of what I did. This is a great verse. Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20, and I'd like to read it to you and, and listen to it very carefully and, and watch with me. The Apostle Paul, says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I have been crucified with Christ. And I got to thinking about that's how Paul brings that experience to him personally. Something that happened so many hundreds and thousands of years ago. To think about, I have been crucified with Christ. And so the first thing I'd like to point out today is I have been crucified with Christ. That is the executed life. The executed life. I have been crucified with Christ. The word execution means to carry out a sentence of death. Execution, to carry out a sentence of death. And certainly with Jesus Christ, the sentence was to crucify him, crucify him. And it was carried out. The executed life. And yet the Apostle Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. Well, how could that take place? Paul was alive when he was writing this verse. And yet he says, I've been executed. I have been crucified with with Christ. If you're a believer here today, do you realize that you have been crucified with Christ? What took place upon that cross with the Lord Jesus Christ? The Apostle Paul said, that happened to me. Well, how do you relate to that? What does it really mean? I have been executed. I have been crucified with Christ. What is he talking about? He isn't saying something is something that might happen. He isn't saying it's something that could happen. He is just simply saying, I have been crucified with Christ. It's almost like we call a double cross. <laughs> Jesus died upon the cross for my sin. And I died there with him. Now let that sink in for just a moment. What does that mean? It means a couple of things when the Apostle Paul is talking about this scripture. I am crucified with Christ. He died to sin and he died to self. He died to sin and he died to self. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 through 3. Let me read those for you. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection, set your minds upon things that are above not on things that are on earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. I love that scripture. God saying to me, Al, you're dead. You're hid in Christ. There's absolutely nothing that can take you out because you are hid in me. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, you remember the scripture. The Romans thought, well, since there's so much grace, we can just continue to sin. And so they asked the Apostle Paul, what shall we sin? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? 
And this is what Paul said. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? I want you to think about being dead to sin today. I realize that we live in a sinful world. To be honest with you, ever since Adam and Eve, it's always been a sinful world. But to think that I'm dead to sin, what does that mean? What does it mean as a believer? It means that I no longer have to live in sin if I choose not to. Now, just because I'm dead to sin doesn't mean that I'm not going to sin once in a while because I still have the flesh and I still have the world that's pulling me and I still have Satan. But that power, that body of sin, that nature of sin no longer controls me according to the Apostle Paul. That's what happened upon the cross of Calvary. I am crucified with Christ. I died to sin. That's why Paul in Romans chapter 6 and verse 11 talks about yield not your members unto unrighteousness. See, I have a choice in this sin question. I don't have to sin. I can say no to it. And Paul said, yield not your members unto unrighteousness, but unto righteousness. I wish somebody had told me that many, many years ago. I didn't realize I had this great power, the living power from the empty cross to be able to overcome sin in my life. That thing that is so painful and leaves such scars. Paul said, I've died with Jesus Christ. See, I can bring the cross right here to where I'm standing today. I am crucified with Christ. Not only did he die to sin, but he died to self. That's important that we understand that. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. It is a very difficult thing to deny self and to crucify self. My biggest enemy, Al Schusler's biggest enemy, his biggest enemy is Al Schusler. Because I don't want to deny myself. I'm not willing to go to that cross daily. I don't have to carry a cross around. I don't have to drag it for thousands of miles. But daily to deny myself. Tony Evans, I put a quote up here. I like this quote concerning what we're talking about right now. As long as you're living for you, all that the cross has to offer will never be yours. If all your living is for you, and all that the cross has to offer will never be yours. Think about that. The second thing that took place upon the cross, Paul said, I no longer live Christ lives in me. That's what we call the exchange life. The exchange life. I no longer live. Paul said, I don't live. But Christ lives within me. Eight times in this scripture, Paul uses the word I or uses the word me. He knew he had an eye problem. He knew he had an ego. He knew that his life had to be changed in exchange for the life of Jesus Christ. It is an exchange life. His life for yours. Now I'm going to put some scriptures up here because I'd really like to let you see the difference between your life and his. And what the cross has to offer us. It's found in Galatians chapter 5 starting at verse number 19. This will be up on the screen. This is my life. What you're going to see is the life that I'm able to produce. And listen to the words that we have before us. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. This is the life I'm going to live. Sexual immorality. Impurity. Lustful pleasure. Idolatry. Sorcery. Hostility, quarreling, jealousy, I'm going to be jealous, outburst of anger, 
selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, you go on and on. That's my life. That's the life that I can produce in the flesh. That's a life that I lived at one time. And that's a life, once in a while, some of those things will still creep into my life. But that's not the life that God wants for us. The life and the power that comes from the cross is found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Now, watch these words when we put them up on the screen. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, and it's joy, and it's peace, and it's long-suffering, and gentleness, and goodness, and faith, and meekness, and temperance, or self-control. That's the exchange life. I cannot produce this life. That is the life of the Lord Jesus Christ that he wants to flow from us. Now, I want you to visualize this. At the age of 45, before I ever understood what we're looking at, I'm going to have him put the flesh life back up there one more time. The life that we did live, or oftentimes we do live. The immorality, the sexual immorality, the hostility. We'll get it up there in just a minute. There we go. Now, let me ask you a question. Is this the life that you want? I don't think any of us would just sit there and say, yeah, that's a life that I want. Although we look at those words, and I'm sure all of us will say, yeah, but I have a little problem with anger. I have a little problem with jealousy. Sometimes even in church there's dissension. Uh, sometimes there's envying and drunkenness. And sometimes there's that selfish ambition. And, and uh, that's not what God wants for us. He wants us to exchange that for the life of the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness, self-control. It's what we call the exchange life. How does that happen? I cannot produce that life of love and joy and peace. That's his life. That is the power that comes from the empty cross. And I would really challenge every one of us here today to look at the two lives and ask which one do I really want for myself. Here's a quote that Watchman Nee said about the exchange life. We think of the Christian life as a changed life. But it is not that. What God offers us is an exchanged life. That makes all the difference in the world. And Watchman Nee is right in the quotation that he just gave us. We think of the Christian life as a changed life, but it is not that. It is an exchanged life. His life for you. The Apostle Paul said, I no longer live, but Christ liveth in me. The third thing that the cross, the power of the cross offers us is the energized life. I live by faith by the Son of God, an energized life. It is a power of God upon our lives to be energized. I think Christianity needs a new dose of energy. <laughs> I really do. There's so much happening around the world, and just what happened in Egypt uh, this morning on Palm Sunday. Uh, the, a couple of churches bombed there, the Coptic churches, and and I think Christianity needs a, a new dose of energy. Uh, to be strong. To be vocal. Let people know that we're still alive. That <laughs> Jesus Christ is more than just on Easter Sunday and on Palm Sunday. It's every Sunday and every day of the week. The power of the cross. The living power of the cross. The empty cross. Energized to live that life by faith. And the Son of God. Philippians chapter 1 verse number 6. Being confident of this thing. That he which had begun a good work in you. Will perform it. Until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of my life verses is right there. Many many years ago. God began a good work in me. It hasn't always looked good. <laughs> but I know. He started a good work in me. And I know this. Sometimes I'd like to push him out of the way because he dogs me a lot. Say, hey, you're not doing right. You need to change. 
And he said, I, I'll, I'll stay on you. I'm going to continue to do this. Paul said, I'm confident in this. He began a good work in me, and he's going to continue that work until Jesus comes again or until I die. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 9. If you have your Bibles, a great, great scripture. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. The Apostle Paul talking about the experience when he was caught up into the third heaven. And God brought a thorn in the flesh. And Paul asked three times, God, would you remove that from me? And God just simply said to him, my grace is sufficient. If we could just ever understand that, we'd have great energy to live the Christian life. And we can do it. As you know, I preached a sermon a few years ago here on Second uh, Chronicles on Jehoshaphat. I just love the story. How that uh, the enemy was, was coming upon him and he began to pray and, and, and he brought his wife and his children around him and he said, you know, I, I don't know what to do. I thought, well, here's this great king. Here's this great man, Jehoshaphat. And he's saying, I don't know what to do. And then he made the statement, even if I did know what to do, he said, I don't have the power to do it. Wow. Isn't that a little bit the way our lives are? I really don't know what to do. And even if I did know, I don't have the power to do it. But I know the one that does know and the one that does have the power. It's an energized life. It's an energized life. Susie Eller said this in a quote, The power of the cross is not found in what I do, but in what has already been done for me. The power of the empty cross. The last thing, I do not set aside the grace of God. I don't slough it off. I don't look at the grace of God and say, phooey, I don't need that. No, he said, I don't set aside the grace of God. I call that the extreme life. Living Christianity to the edge. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. You see, I don't think we live Christianity to the extreme. Shirley and I have been married 59 years uh, in June. And I, I, I still don't have marriage all figured out. But I'm working on it, right? Getting better. <laughs> you shake your head, no? Yeah, like that? You don't know what that means? But one thing we decided a number of years ago, when God really did a work in her life, and did a work in mine, that our marriage was going to be lived to the extreme. And we wanted that more than anything else. You see, if you don't grab a hold of these things and understand what the cross has provided and, and what God's able to do, something that I wasn't able to do to take our marriage to the extreme. I couldn't even take my life to the extreme. And yet it's something that I know God wanted me to do for our children's sake, that our children could see that that marriage has gone to the extreme. Give everything to her and everything she gives to me. In Jesus Christ. That's the power, the living power of the empty cross. Live it to the extreme. Paul lived there. He said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I don't know where that's going to take me. I'm still anxious. Wanting to know what God's going to do with my life. What's out there yet to be explored? The horizon of Christianity is so easy as we come to church and we've been coming to church for years to just sit at a chair and say, well, I guess that's about it with Christianity. I went to church today and going home, we'll go watch football games this afternoon. Well, we'll watch the Masters probably. And, uh, or maybe some um, NASCAR. NASCAR, we'll watch that. That's exciting. 
And uh, that's just all Christianity has to offer. Let me tell you something. Christianity can take you to the extreme in your Christian living. The Apostle Paul said, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling. You remember Caleb, 85 years old? He said, I want that mountain and I'm going to claim what God has for me. I love the story of Caleb. The older I get, the more I love it. 85 years old, and he said, I, I want that mountain, the extreme life. Well, everybody else was just sitting around and said, well, probably not going to last much longer. I'll be checking out of here and I'll be gone. I hope they get flowers for me and maybe two or three people come by and say goodbye to me in the casket. No, no, not Caleb. He, he lived life to the extreme. It needs to be that way in our marriages, in our life, in our jobs, our service to the church. It needs to be that way here at Glidville. We need to be living life to the extreme. I guarantee you we don't, and we could. Just realize what took place upon the cross. The living power of the empty cross. The great, great power. Beth Moore said this. Fear of the future makes people settle for things in the present that completely defy the abundant life. Fear of the future. I just live in the present. And we miss out on the extreme abundant life. Jesus said, I have come to give you life and I have come to give it to you abundantly in an extreme way. When Jesus was on the cross, his mind was on you. When Jesus was on the cross, his mind was on you. We can use one of three different kinds of life if we want to. The first one is called the caged life, like a bird cage, a caged life, trapped in our fears, our bitterness, our victimhood, and our sadness, or our anger. We can be in prison to those things. Bitterness. I'm the victim. I'm angry. At somebody out here that's controlling our life and causing that. And we can live that life if we choose to live it. Or we can live the comfortable life. That's a better life. It's really a life of indifference and boredom and restlessness and nothing fulfilled, but we're comfortable. We can live that life. Or we can live the charged life, fully engaged, energized, extreme, Christianity, the cross, Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, great power provided for each and every one of us here today. John chapter 12, verse 24. It's going to be up on the screen. And I'd like to challenge you with this verse today. It's so true. And um, I hope that you can really grasp what this is saying. John chapter 12. Let me read it. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. A grain of wheat. A little grain of wheat. My dad was a wheat farmer. And he had the bin full of wheat, little grains. And he would take the little grain, one, and plant it in the ground, and moisture. Eventually, the outer shell of that wheat got soft. A little shoot would come out. And a little stalk. 
Eventually, there was a head that came on top that had not just one grain of wheat in it, maybe 12 to 15 grain multiplied. If it's not planted in the ground, it remains alone. Just a little grain of wheat. You know, in the pyramids in Egypt, that they've found grains of wheat that far back, that they've actually planted, and they germinated, and produced wheat. What happened? It was a grain of wheat, but it stood alone all by itself. You see, the hard shell around that wheat, around that grain, would not let the life come forth. The life was in there. A thousand year, the life was there. It couldn't get out. Because that outer shell, that grain was hard. And when it was planted in the ground, that shell was softened. Now that life was able to come out. A little shoot, a little boot, stem. And then it produced a number of of grains of wheat. Well, that's the way life is. You see, the life of Jesus Christ that dwells within me, that love and that joy and that peace and that patience and gentleness and goodness and that faith and that meekness, it can't get out because I have an outer shell to be that's hardened. It's called Al Schusler's shell. I like to live my own life. And the life of Jesus can't get out until this shell is softened. And when it's softened, now the life of Jesus can flow out of me. You ever wonder why sometimes you have trials that come into your life? Issues? Painful things? Because God's allowing that. He may not have brought that into your life, but he's allowing that to soften your life so that his life can flow out of you. That's a great picture. Think about it. If we would just soften the outer shells of our life, it's amazing as to what we could accomplish individually, and as a church. We're going to have an invitation in just a few minutes time when we can make some changes in our life. In closing, I'd like to say this. I've made about five great decisions in my life that was life changing. One of them was when I was about nine years old at a little country church. I came to an altar just like this. I knelt my parents came and prayed with me. And I asked Jesus Christ into my life. Because of the cross, I was able to do that. But then, I'm like you. I became a teenager. And I got a little wild. I know you don't know what you're talking about, but I did. But let me take that back. I didn't get a little wild. <laughs> I really got wild. Brought shame to my mom and dad. But I can remember my wife, and I was probably 27 years old. My wife, she started going back to church, and, and she told the preacher everything I did. <laughs> Sin this. And she said, you want to go to church with us? I said, no. So she'd take those little kids to church. And one Sunday, it got the best of me. And I followed her to church. And that preacher, he's about six, three or four. His index finger was that long. <laughs> right in my face. I got home. I was so mad at her. But I remember that Sunday. I came to an old-fashioned altar and asked God to forgive me. And he did. And bless you, three years later, God calls me into the ministry. I was 30 years old. Three little kids came to an altar. Extreme life, that's what I wanted. 
I thought I had it all figured out. I didn't. Now I'm 45 years old and still trying to figure it out. <laughs> I'm a slow learner. And so then God brings a situation into my life and I spent the whole day out in the middle of a section of land where I grew up on the farm sitting in a pickup crying my heart out to God. I hurt so much because I did not understand the living power of the cross. A year later, I'm at the cemetery. I'm sitting on the gravestone of our little grandbaby that died. I sat there for a solid day. I had to have some answers. And God gave them to me. Al had to die. And the outer shell was softened. And then the life of Christ could begin to flow. Not my life, but his life. I don't know where you might be today. This is Easter time. The time to make a change in life. Get energized. Move to the extreme. Live the exchange life.